Good morning to everyone who's joining. We will get started at exactly 10.01, so stay tuned. Welcome everyone to our final session of our Brown Implementation Science Seminar Series. Um, this is our sixth session of the Fall 2021 series, and we're really excited to welcome our guest, Dr. Erica Krabel. Um, I'm Ronnie Elwe, and I'm Director of the Implementation Science Corps in the Brown uh, Department of uh, Psychiatry and Human Behavior. And these fall 2021 implementation science seminar series are sponsored by uh, Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior, the Brown School of Public Health um, Arch Center, as well as Advanced CTR. So thanks so much to those groups for being part of this seminar series. Dr. Erica Krabel is a postdoctoral scholar and health services researcher at the University of California, San Diego. Her research focuses on using dissemination and implementation science approaches to improve the use of research evidence in policymaking and to improve access to evidence-based substance use treatment and mental health services for safety net and justice involved populations. Dr. Crable is also a fellow with the NIMH funded Implementation Research Institute, which is directed by Dr. Enola Proctor and the Lifespan Brown University Criminal Justice Research Training Program. Prior to pursuing an academic research career, Dr. Crable worked at IBM Watson Health as a health policy consultant to federal agencies, including the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Dr. Crable received her PhD in health services research from Boston University School of Public Health, where I had the pleasure of first meeting her when I was faculty there and saw firsthand her innovations in implementation science. While at BU, Dr. Crable was the first PhD fellow to work with the Evans Center for Implementation and Improvement Sciences, or CEASE, a center which has been a leader in combining these two forms of sciences to increase access to evidence-based practices across the largest safety net hospital setting in New England. Thank you for joining me in welcoming Dr. Crable, who is on Pacific time, to our Brown Implementation Science Seminar Series. Thank you so much, Dr. Elway. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to everyone for joining us this morning, whether you're on the East, West Coast or in the Midwest. Um, so I'm delighted to be here with this amazing group and talk about one of my favorite topics, which is advancing health policy, dissemination and implementation science. So let's, so I think what we'll do today is think about like, what are the goals of health policy DNI? and we'll define it, what is this emergent subfield of health policy DNI? And then we'll take a trip around the US to different studies that I've been a part of and think about how policy is impacting dissemination and implementation efforts at the organizational, the systems and state levels. And we'll start in North Carolina uh, over on the East Coast and talk a li about little p or organizational policy implementation efforts in a probation setting. And then we'll hop a few flights together and visit Virginia, West Virginia, and California to talk about the influence of big P policies or federal policy pushing out state policies. And then we'll finally land up north in Oregon, where I'm working with Dr. Gregory Ahrens on a study that navigates the bi-directional organizational and state level policy influences. And then the common thread across this whole journey together is the role of policy in improving access or the quality of substance use treatment, which is a topic near and dear to my heart um, but I think a lot of lessons from this journey will be applicable to other content areas as well. And so we'll finish up this talk by reflecting on our jet lag a little bit and thinking about emergent areas for health policy, dissemination and implementation science research to continue growing across content areas. So we'll get started with a little bit of what, is, what do we mean by health policy, dissemination and implementation science? 
So we know that journal articles don't read themselves and they certainly aren't always the best approach for sharing information with providers or policymakers whose behavior we often wanna influence. We need strategies to help share knowledge about evidence-based practices. And this is where dissemination science comes into hand, right? It's the scientific study of targeted distribution of information and intervention materials to specific public health or clinical practice audiences. But what could this mean at the policy level? We don't have a commonly used definition for policy dissemination science quite yet, but broadly I'd say that it seeks to examine the processes by which research evidence is spread and used by policymakers to inform their decision making. And we're interested broadly in how policymakers receive, solicit, and adopt evidence. Implementation science, I'm sure you're familiar with, it's the scientific study of the use of strategies to adopt and integrate evidence-based health interventions with the goal of benefiting individual outcomes and population health. But at the policy level, we can use implementation science to examine processes and strategies by which evidence-based policies are put into routine practice, or we could use it to measure the impact of an evidence-based policy on population health outcomes. So with a few brief definitions behind us, I'm curious if anyone in this audience has ever led or supported a health policy dissemination or implementation science study. And so if you wouldn't mind, I'm just curious if you could answer in the chat and you can select the everyone option so we can all see it and just say yes, no, or maybe no, but you want to and you have interest in this. So we'll just wait a minute, see if anybody's awake yet. Okay. Okay, so some experience, some interest. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So as people maybe continue to reply, we will we'll move on, but keep the keep the replies and questions coming because I'm curious where we're all at as an audience together. Um, and while we do that, I want to talk about what kind of lens can, that health policy D and I can bring to our research. So there's a small, but albeit growing number of calls for more work in this space. And I've summarized my and some other colleagues calls for research in this area. And you can check out the sources at the bottom of the page for more information, um, or I'm happy to provide that later in this talk. The first area that I think is really important is formative contextual assessment. So this could be pre-implementation research, that investigates mechanisms and determinants that influence the use of evidence or evidence-based practice and policies. So this includes identifying factors that mediate or moderate policymakers' use of evidence. We might study the adoption of an evidence-based policy through implementation and sustainment phases as well. We can also think about testing dissemination or implementation strategies. So pre-implementation research might test dissemination strategies that promote evidence use by policymakers during the policy formulation period. And implementation research might test strategies that promote the uptake of an evidence-based practice. We can also examine and test dissemination and implementation science frameworks in ways that better conceptualize and consider the impact of policy or influences on policy DNI processes. And this one's particularly of interest to me because there aren't a ton of policy relevant frameworks in the DNI space. And I've been working with some colleagues to show how one framework, specifically the EPIS framework, but also others can be optimized for policy research. And in short, you know, I'll just say that I think we need more models and frameworks that don't treat policy as a nuisance variable in the outer context. We need to make it more focal and intentional in our work. Policy process studies can also be useful for helping us understand steps to implement policy and perceptions of implementation strategies. Measurement work is desperately needed to quantify the impact of evidence-based policy on population health outcomes or quantify the impact of mediators and moderators on policy DNI efforts. But you know, this is not all, this is sort of a brief snapshot and it's an emergent subfield that's really ready for your new ideas and areas of inquiry. So I'd encourage you all to get really curious. 
couple other definitions before we go on our journey. Um, what do we mean by policy? Policies are sometimes referred to as big P or little P policies. A big P policy is typically thought of as occurring at the federal or state level, but it can also happen at county and city levels. Big P policy includes laws like the Affordable Care Act, the Support Act, administrative rules and regulations, which can be set by a state governor or public health declarations, which can occur at any of the levels we just talked about. So a recent example I'm sure we're all, all too familiar with is the federal COVID-19 emergency declaration. Little P policies, um, on the other hand, they generally occur at the organizational level and they include things like professional guidelines and recommendations for practice like the American Society of Addiction Medicine's National Practice Guideline for the Treatment of Opioid Use Disorders. Little P policies can also be facility policies like a tobacco-free hospital policy. And I'll just also say that this might be, this big P versus little P may be a really useful distinction for researchers and policy wonks, but it also might be completely meaningless to other stakeholders like clinicians and patients. You know, we need to consider how policy impacts clinicians and patients and other stakeholders' day-to-day -day lives. Little P policies might have more of an impact on them, you know, when they go about their day accessing services from an organization, might be more impactful than a big P policy, which is more distal. However, I might also argue that big P policy has a more profound impact on the array of services that are even eligible to patients accessing care, and therefore it has a significant impact on population health outcomes. So despite the important upstream impact that policy plays influencing our healthcare access, quality, and patient outcomes, the complex policies of health policy DNI are pretty understudied. But overall, this idea of studying policy isn't new either. Political scientists and public administration scholars have been investigating policy development, diffusion, and implementation since the 1970s, albeit using really different language than DNI researchers use today. So while there's a lot of work to do here in this emergent subfield of health policy DNI, and we may be really eager to stake a claim in, in this emergent field, we also really need to be mindful of lessons from other fields and sort of learn as we go. So I hope that for this brief primer, I've convinced you that this is a really important area of work and there are a ton of unanswered questions about how to increase evidence-based big P and little p policy making and understand the impact of evidence-based policies on population health outcomes and equity. I think this work is really critical to enhancing access and use of high quality substance use treatment and harm reduction services, especially for racial and ethnic minority populations that have, that have been historically um, experienced more health inequities and health injustices related to accessing substance use treatment. And we can't shy away from policy DNI just because policy is messy or deals with political or advocacy issues, which we tend to think of as non-research. We need to conduct research that promotes policymakers and, and constituent trust in and use of scientific evidence. And if we don't sort of pursue this really important work, I'd argue we have a few major consequences. The gap between research and policy will only widen and the definitions that policymakers and researchers use when describing evidence could become more distal and murky, making it hard for researchers like yourselves to promote practical applications of your studies. We also need to work on promoting trust in research evidence, and that depends on how we communicate our methods and findings to policymakers and community members alike. So just really arguing for a focus on dissemination science with policies in mind. Okay. So with some foundational knowledge of health policy DNI behind us, I think it's time to begin our three-leg journey. And I'll just emphasize that these are really pit stops in each state or study, not a full presentation of the work being done here. The goal is really to show how a few examples of health policy DNI research can be applied to substance use and mental health services context. So everybody get your bags ready, grab your coffee, and we will get started on this journey. Okay, welcome to beautiful North Carolina. So this is a study led by a dear friend of mine, Dr. Tanya Van Dens at UNC. 
And um, I'll just mention that our time on this project was actually funded by the Fosbeck Fund, as well as the Lifespan Brown University Criminal Justice Research Training Program, where we we're both fellows. And in this study, Tanya and I investigated a little P policy at the organizational level that was became an implementation effort to adopt specialty mental health probation models in six counties in North Carolina. So let me talk a little bit about that policy and what it was. In 2002, the Council for St of State Governments released a national statement calling for specialized approaches to supervise individuals living with mental illnesses and substance use disorders. And this is because traditional probation doesn't typically work out to the best extent with that population. Individuals living with mental illnesses and substance use disorders traditionally have had um, a hard time being compliant with traditional supervision requirements. Uh, they have more pressing needs like accessing treatment or having a stable place to live rather than necessarily being compliant with the request of a probation officer. So the Council of State Government said we really need a different way to approach supervision with this population. So what they released is a little p organizational policy guideline. Um, and I'll mention that they are a nonpartisan, non-governing body. So that's why I think of this as a practice guideline. And we'll also note that their national policy statement calling for a specialized type of supervision aligns with what is considered the prototypical model for specialty mental health probation or SMHP. So specialty mental health probation calls for <clears throat> a few things in its prototypical model, reduced caseload sizes, comprised exclusively of individuals with mental health and substance use treatment needs. And I would argue that those two elements are pretty straightforward and easy to measure, right? We can see if that's happening, our caseloads reducing, our caseloads exclusive. But this prototypical model calls for additional sustained mental health training for officers and a problem solving orientation for supervision, as well as collaboration between the probation agency, officers, and external resources to help link supervised individuals to supports in the community. And I think those three on the right side of the screen are a little bit more vague and unsurprisingly, others do too. So there's been a lot of research suggesting that there's substantial variation when specialty mental health probation is implemented across the country. We don't have a lot of fidelity to this model. So the study aims were aligned with the goals of mid-implementation policy processes and contextual assessment studies that we talked about on a few slides ago. In this study, we wanted to qualitatively describe how implementation of an organizational specialty mental health probation policy occurred in probation agencies in those six counties and identify variations of the model due to contextual influences in the probation offices. So we used qualitative interviews with officers and chiefs and then analyzed the transcripts using deductive approaches with constructs related to the practical robust implementation and sustainability model. And again, this is a pit stop in North Carolina on our three leg journey. So I'm not gonna get into the weeds on the methods or the findings. We'll just do a high level approach. Um, so taking a health policy DNI lens in this study allowed us to investigate implementation and variation of specialty mental health probation policy and practice. So what we found were a few themes related to the prototypical model. First, we found that meaningfully reduced caseload size is critical to delivering quality specialty mental health probation. Rather than the idea of a caseload size of 50, officers and chiefs really said that caseloads of less than 40 were ideal but they were actually really hard to attain due to a culture of high caseloads of more than 100, and as, as well as a total lack of institutional support from probation agency leadership to do this. So there's clearly a misalignment between policy for specialty mental health probation and practice. Almost every officer we spoke to had a mixed caseload and said specialty caseloads were not the norm and not the expectation. Some officers were excited to use their newly gained crisis stabilization skills when supervising traditional caseloads. They felt that they, could, they had crossover application. Um, so they were happy to use it with individuals living with mental health and substance use needs, as well as individuals who did not identify for those needs. But in general, there was no mention that this was a necessary, you know, having an exclusive caseload was necessary or important to the model implementation. 
We also, I'm going to switch over to the problem solving now. This one was really interesting to me. Officers told us that they had this ability to empathize, problem solve, and individualize supervision. And that was really critical to specialty mental health probation delivery, because we wanted to know what does it mean to have a problem solving orientation? Um, and what we found is that officers and chiefs said some officers were better suited than others to deliver this kind of supervision because the ability to problem solve or thinks outside of the box and tailor supervision was due to individual officers' personal abilities to build rapport and empathize the way that they communicated with other humans. And it wasn't something they felt could be taught at all. So this raises a lot of problems and questions for how we replicate or scale out this model. If it's something that is seen as intrinsically or innate to the officers themselves. We also found that specialized trainings needed to be offered regularly to officers and their chiefs. So the kind of specialty mental health training that they wanted was crisis stabilization, training about the chronic nature of substance use as a chronic disease, rather than seeing it as a moral failure, things like that. And the problem here that we didn't anticipate finding was that chiefs didn't receive this training at all. We thought that sort of everyone was getting this training, but in practice due to institutional policies that competed with the SMHP policy, chiefs didn't receive training at all and felt that they couldn't supervise effectively because they, they weren't knowledgeable about the topics their officers cared about. And finally, <clears throat> we found that open communication and collaboration with community-based partners was truly essential to effectively delivering specialty mental health probation. Officers reported having really productive relationships with community-based social workers, temporary employment agencies, local residential housing authority, shelter, food banks, the Department of Child Services, and these relationships helped individuals they supervised navigate challenges beyond probation, like securing employment or addressing housing or child custody issues. So unlike the prototypical model that was kind of confusing, it's not just, you know, and maybe this idea that it's just about linking individuals to substance use and mental health services in the community, it's not. It's really about meeting their basic needs for housing, food, and bringing families back together after incarceration that was critical to delivering specialty mental health probation. So just to wrap up in North Carolina, I would say that this study helped define what some of the vague specialty mental health probation policy components look like when they're adopted as an actual probation policy and practice in six counties in North Carolina. And this gave us an eye on contextual factors that can impact the adoption of a professional guideline. So let's keep, pack our bags again and keep jetting around the US with a few pit stops in Virginia, West Virginia, and California. My absolute favorite three states because of their wildly interesting Medicaid programs. Um, so again, high level discussion of the study, just to give you a sense of what different health policy DNI studies could look like. So it's no secret, and I'm sure this audience is familiar, that the US is experiencing a 10 plus year opioid epidemic. But what you might not know is that it disproportionately impacts the Medicaid population. About 38% of, adult, of American adults living with an opioid use disorder are publicly insured Medicaid participants. And Medicaid participants account for nearly half of all opioid related deaths in states hit hardest by the opioid epidemic like West Virginia, for example. But Medicaid benefits for substance use treatment are pretty sparse in most Medicaid programs. And when they do exist, they're not evidence-based. So we obviously have a great opportunity for health policy DNI on our hands. And one policy mechanism worth investigating is state's use of the 1115 waiver to improve substance use treatment for Medicaid benefit arrays. So you're probably like, it's really early. What is she talking about 1115 waivers? Like, what is that? <laughs> Basically, all you need to know is that 1115 waiver is an allowance from the Social Security Act that just allows Medicaid programs to test out innovative ways to deliver benefits without imposing any additional cost to the federal government or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that oversee state Medicaid programs. So it sort of allows states to, to run demonstration projects, really. So CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, asked states to consider using waivers to redesign their substance use disorder treatment delivery systems and to provide a continuum 
of services similar to the American Society of Addiction Medicine criteria. And that's what's sort of pictured here. They wanted to see a continuum of early intervention, outpatient, intensive outpatient, residential, and intensive inpatient services, as well as withdrawal management, medications for opioid use disorder, and recovery support services. So I thought, well, that sounds really interesting. And I decided that I wanted to investigate how Medicaid agencies went about the sort of pre-implementation decision-making process of even identifying a need to improve their service benefit arrays, like why go that extra effort to do this? Um, and I also wanted to really understand how they designed this new policy and selected the evidence-based practices that would populate their care continuums. And I wanted to highlight this research because it demonstrates an observational way to examine dissemination from a policy process and contextual assessment lens. So real high level methods, I use document review and qualitative semi-structured interviews with key informants from CMS, as well as from California, Virginia and West Virginia Medicaid agencies, as well as other state health departments, behavioral health departments in those same states, um, Medicaid participating providers. I also interviewed representatives from managed care organizations, um, advocacy groups and consulting firms that lobby Medicaid agencies as well. And I use an adapted version of EPIS to guide a deductive analysis of relevant constructs that came up in the interviews during state's exploration and preparation phases. And I'll also mention that this study was also funded by the Lifespan Brown University Criminal Justice Research Training Program. So real quick, um, this is the adapted version of the exploration, preparation, implementation, and sustainment framework that I used to guide my research. So on the left side, you have the outer context, which I conceptualized as a broad state federal environment. Uh, that is where the block grant safety net substance use treatment funding comes from. That's where managed care organizations and clients live. And you'll notice the star on the bottom here is because I added socio-political influences and media attention. Those were not in the original model, but I felt they were important to add because we know from the public administration and poli-sci literature that these factors are really good at driving policy decisions for better or worse. Moving over to the green in the inner context, this is another adaptation to the model. I considered this, instead of being a provider organization level, which I think people are familiar seeing the EPIS framework used at, um, EPIS was actually designed to be a really flexible policy level framework. So I conceptualized the inner context as a state Medicaid agency itself. And so you have the agency leadership, organizational characteristics, but what I also added here is a service environment to account for the nature of existing Medicaid benefits. Bridging factors in red account for intermediaries or contracts that link outer and inner context to support implementation. And here it's important to consider the functions and forms of these types of relational ties that create linkages between the context. And then in yellow, you know, we need to really consider what our innovation is. Is it the policy vehicle or is it the evidence-based practice being implemented? And your answer to that question may depend on the study and the nature of the policy that you're studying. And in this project, I decided the innovation is the care continuum described in each state's new said policy waiver. So very high level findings to explain Medicaid agencies, inner context and outer context pre-implementation decisions. Basically, what I found is in their exploration phase, I wanted to know why Medicaid agency leaders and stakeholders would even decide to expand substance use disorder benefits, right? Like, obviously, there's an altruistic public good component to this, but what's their motivation? Why go this extra effort and create all this work and invite CMS into their backyard to oversee a demonstration? And what I found talking to all of those stakeholders is that the state Medicaid agency staff particularly was really abhorred with the poor existing substance use disorder Medicaid benefits that existed. They, in most cases, had not been updated for a decade. They were not evidence-based. They were homegrown measures, and they just really were not meeting the needs of their population. And that ended up meaning that state Medicaid programs had a really unsustainable reliance on non-Medicaid state safety net funds to pay for substance use disorder treatment because the benefits were just too sparse. And so they often looked to their block grant 
to supplement funds and get people linked to care through the behavioral health departments, which is obviously not a very sustainable way to run a Medicaid program. We also saw that the opioid epidemic, particularly in Virginia and West Virginia, really was driving a number of unnecessary deaths and state Medicaid agencies just really wanted to respond and help the population that they were designed to serve. So, and I'll say this didn't come up in California because the opioid epidemic really hadn't hit there in the same way by the time I had done these interviews. When states started moving into the preparation phase, so they've decided that they have a problem. They're trying to think through, you know, what's the policy we're going to design? And I wanted to know, how did they actually select the new evidence-based practices for their planned care continuums? And what I learned from all three states is that policymakers at the Medicaid agencies really perceived CMS's recommendation to use the American Society of Addiction medicine criteria as a requirement. CMS just highlighted this in their policy request as an option, but states sort of said, well, that's clearly what they want. They felt it was sort of a tacit uh, request for them to use that criteria. So that's what they tried to do. We also saw that Medicaid agencies really rely on interorganizational networks to identify evidence-based practices. So Medicaid agencies set up work groups and these work groups were comprised of well-known Medicaid providers, um, academics from local institutions that the agencies had in their states, and just general experts from the substance use treatment community to look at practices and vet them for their evidence. They also, um, state Medicaid agency staff also talked about reaching out to their behavioral health and public health departments in their states to say, hey, well, what do you think is going to work? You have more expertise in this particular topic than I. Tell me what works. They also picked up the phone and called other state Medicaid programs. I heard that a lot. Uh, states didn't necessarily call their geographic neighbors, but they called programs that they considered to be similar to them, right? So you might argue that California and Massachusetts are some of the most robust state Medicaid programs that so they may consider themselves neighbors, whereas California may not consider you know, Oregon to be a neighbor per se, in terms of their similarities in the kinds of services and their mission to serve constituents. Also in the preparation phase, we found that, um, you know, I wanted to know, okay, just because you wanna design a policy and expand services, you still have this husky problem of having to pay for them. So how did the state Medicaid agencies convince their state legislatures to expand their budgets and pay for all these new services? Um, and maybe less in Rhode Island, but in many places around the country, Medicaid is a pretty politicized issue. Um, so getting the state legislature on board to spend more money for adult Medicaid beneficiaries is a tricky thing, especially when it comes to something so stigmatized like substance use disorder treatment. And states really ran into issues doing that. So they ended up reframing the need for substance use service expansion. They said, forget about those adult participants in Medicaid. Let's not worry about them. What we really want to do is reduce the negative downstream effects of substance use on children. There's a lot of children from Medicaid participants who are being born with neonatal abstinence syndrome, or there's a lot of children of these participants who are going into foster care because of um, untreated substance use disorder. So let's worry about giving services as a way to help the babies. And that argument really worked in Virginia and West Virginia. In California, things were a little bit different. They actually said, you know, forget about this idea that we need to expand benefits. Of course we do. Their legislator was a little bit more friendly to that topic. But what they said to really seal the deal was, there's a lot of fraud, waste, and abuse in our program with providers erroneously charging for services they don't deliver. So let's do this as a way to restructure the entire program put in more oversights to prevent, prevent fraud and promote program integrity. So that's really how they sealed the deal there. Um, and I'll also just say, if you're, more interest, if you're interested in more details about how I studied this policy development process and the dissemination of evidence-based practices to policymakers, that article's coming out in the Journal of Health Politics, Policy and Law, and a related manuscript documenting the implementation strategies that states actually use to stand up all of these new services with providers and managed care organizations is coming out in the Implementation Science Journal. So I'd be happy to share those. Okay, 
Let's pack our bags one more time and head to Oregon where I'm currently working. So the current study I'm working on is led by Dr. Gregory Ahrens at the University of California, San Diego, and it's called the Statewide System and Organizational Strategy for Evidence-Based Practice Implementation and Sustainment in Substance Use Treatment. And this is a uh, NIDA-funded study. So substance use treatment delivery services, service delivery is typically occurring in complex systems where decisions and policies created at state levels, like we just talked about, they affect day-to-day -day service delivery, right? But most implementation strategies that we tend to study, they don't account for this sort of complex multi-level context. And that results in a really bad disconnection between policy, funding, and service delivery across provider, organizational, and systems levels. So this study requires aligning with existing organizational and systems level missions and policies that already promote evidence-based practice, substance use treatment and quality monitoring. So we are, the thing that we're trying to do is promote evidence-based practice adoption of motivational interviewing, as well as listen. And listen is an artificial intelligence quality assurance platform. It's a software that providers can use during their motivational interviewing sessions to record the session and receive real-time transcription and data on the quality of their motivational interview and delivery and assessment. They'll also receive sort of metrics assessing their performance on different aspects of motivational interviewing principles like demonstrating empathy. So big picture in this study, one of our goals is to eventually influence the adoption of existing or new policies to help increase access to high quality motivational interviewing and the use of listen. Right? How do, we, how do we do that? That's a little bit complicated. So what we're using is testing the, the leadership and organizational change for implementation systems level strategy to support the uptake of motivational interviewing and listen in substance use disorder treatment clinics across Oregon. And LOS ISL, as I'll call it, it's a multi-level implementation strategy. So again, real high level, there, we could have a whole presentation on LOSI. Uh, because it is a really complex and fascinating implementation strategy, but broadly it seeks to improve general and implementation leadership, create a positive strategic climate for evidence-based practice implementation and sustainment, develop and promote the use of strategies to align systems, organizations, and clinics through sort of epis bridging factors like I've introduced in the past study. And LOSI has several components. It's data-driven. So day one, we go into an organization and we collect a lot of data and we start to put together 360 degree assessments of their organizational climate for implementation. We also think about um, how do we improve leadership, right? So we have leadership training and leadership coaching and one-on-one -on -one and group sessions throughout the study. And then we work with providers and leaders at different levels to engage in system level alignment with problem solving between these multi-levels and organizational strategy develop, development to improve a climate for evidence-based practice adoption. So there are a ton of study aims because you're probably getting the sense that this is a big study, which it definitely is. Um, so I'm only gonna highlight two of the aims here that are relevant, um, super relevant to policy. All of them tie in, of course. So in this study, one of our aims is to test the effect of that leadership LOS ISL strategy on systems, organization, and work group level leadership, implementation climate, provider evidence-based practice attitudes, and citizenship behaviors. But in this study, we also wanna characterize the process of systems engagement and our impacts on substance use treatment facilities. So this really requires understanding and working with provider organizations, managed care organizations, state health department, policy commissions at the state level, member organizations, providers, or providers and payers, the list really goes on. So this study is kind of doing the most, right? Like it's pretty big. Um, we're conducting contextual assessment to really understand the policy environment and see what is a welcoming climate for evidence-based practice, motivational interviewing and quality assurance platform like LISTEN. We're studying ongoing and future policy processes so that we can align with implementation goals at the state level as well. 
We're also testing strategies by using low ISL and applying it at the systems level. And we're also advancing how we measure systems and policy level influences. So there's a lot to explore and unpack here. Um, and I love this study because it is so much going on. You know, I think this study is a great example of why policy is really fun because it gives you a chance to play detective. So the first thing we did when we got to Oregon is we started mapping the policy context. And I think this is a useful first step if people are less familiar with health policy DNI and want to figure out how they get started. Map the policy context, really understand where you're working. So this has been my main focus for a few months. Um, I'm constantly looking at the state health department, the Medicaid agency, the Senate and House and the states to see how existing policies related to substance use treatment align or compete with our implementation goals for high quality motivational interviewing and quality assurance CLSN. And I'll say that this process revealed several governor's behavioral health work group recommendations. There's a state commission that released strategic priorities that align with our goals. We've seen legislative measures that all contribute to a policy context for substance use treatment and quality monitoring. So our process has been about like, how do we identify those? And then how do we align our study with it so that we're delivering something that they care about? <clears throat> We've also been identifying relevant stakeholders from state agencies, advocacy groups, and others that can influence policy. And I'll say that this is a process, the stakeholder identification is a process that never seems to finish, and that's okay in health policy DNI. That's the way it goes. It's important to remember that some stakeholders play more or less important roles at different phases of implementation. So some stakeholders help to influence evidence-based practice identification, while others are really useful on the ground getting evidence-based practices adopted. And you can identify these stakeholders and their roles and responsibilities using document review methods like I showed in my Medicaid study, or just by talking to people. So here's just a quick visual example. The point's not to read this graphic, it's just to show visually how I actually mapped the policy context in Oregon. I start by asking which actors or entities are working and operating at each level, the policy level, the systems level, the organizational level. How are their roles, responsibilities, and priorities shaping out? Um, how do these different stakeholders engage with each other? And that's what the arrows are. You know, Do they talk to each other? Do they report to each other? Are there contractual relationships or ties that can be leveraged as bridging factors or potential policy measurement products? And then I'm always asking myself, what am I missing? That's sort of what that box on the lower right is. What have I missed? What do I keep needing to add to this? Because this is an iterative process. I'll also say um, this study is a great example for why health policy DNI requires engagement uh, on a lot of levels, specifically the policy level, right? But when we're talking about substance use treatment implementation, we usually need to wanna talk with systems and organizational level stakeholders as well to understand how services are being administered as benefits or delivered by provider groups. And engaging with this type of, this, this very diverse list of stakeholders takes a lot of work. So here are just a few suggestions that have worked for me. You can observe a policy process in public meetings. That's the great thing about working with state systems is that everything they do has to be public and you can attend any meeting you want or get notes from it. You can also identify relevant civic intermediaries. These are like group organ um, public organizations like nonprofit or nonpartisan groups who might already be working in a policy space of interest to you. They might have useful relationships that you can learn from as well. I'm also just a huge fan of cold calls and emails. People usually reply, especially people whose jobs are paid for by tax dollars. They seem to have a real desire to be responsive, which is great. Networking, um, this is another pretty easy one. Ask yourself, who do you know in the space that you wanna work in? Who do they know? Attend conferences where policymakers go. That's a big one. In my K application I, that I'm doing at the policy level, I actually, wrote in my budget that I wanted to attend multiple conferences that cater to policymakers as a way to engage with them. And then my suggestion and what's really worked for us in Oregon is to do an exhausting combination of all of the above. It takes a lot of time, but it's really worth it. 
So once you understand the policy context better and you have it mapped as much as you can and continue that iterative process, um, and you also know who to reach out to, to go to for policy and systems level engagement, you need to think about relationship building. So here are some additional tips that have worked for us in Oregon as we start this study. It's important to articulate clear asks with policymakers. Um, they don't have a lot of time. It's good to get to the point and be very specific about what you need. But in order to do that, you need to build a relationship with them first. It's not, you don't schedule a meeting and, and then ask them for something. They're likely not gonna be highly receptive to that. So know when to make the ask. It's also important that, you know, what you ask for may not be appropriate. So you need to be amenable to revisions. For example, we've gone into Oregon and say, I have four, four asks for a certain policymaker. Um, I might have to walk away with three of those asks and that's fine. I need to know what's my low hanging fruit and what's kind of more ideal circumstances. And it's not just about what they can do for you. You need to share your resources as a researcher. How can you help them? You can look, see this as an opportunity for co-creation. Um, while I have found policymakers to be highly responsive to me, it's important to understand that not all policymakers see a true value in science and research. And that's okay, we can work with that. It's important to open a conversation, have a dialogue, understand their hesitations for your research and answer questions they have to make them really understand what you're doing. So you really need to be a good communicator and use language that's not full of scientific jargon. It's also important to just be persistent. Um, again, your study is not the most important thing they have going on in their world. So it may take a few tries to get them interested in what you're doing. And in order to really get their attention, I would highly suggest knowing their calendar. And at a very basic level, that just means knowing when they're too busy. Um, some weeks are more legislative heavy than others. Some weeks are budget decision weeks and just avoid those at all costs. And these are just some tips that have really worked for us as we navigate the Oregon context and think about how we engage with policymakers while simultaneously engaging with providers for the adoption of motivational interviewing and listen. It's kind of a bottom up, top down approach um, in this state because they do have an extremely active policy context and the bi-directional influences of policy are very strong in this state. So after all this travel across the country, we're probably pretty exhausted, but I just wanna highlight a few lessons for us to think about as we let the jet lag roll over us. Policies come in all sizes of scope and influence and directions, right? Sometimes they're unidirectional, sometimes they're bi-directional. Um, so it's important to be thinking about that as you map the policy context and think about how you wanna engage with policymakers. And that's really gonna depend on the context that you find yourself in and your study aims. There are lots of opportunity for contextual assessment. You've seen that across all the study examples I presented today. Um, I will say that process is messy, but extremely necessary. But it's not just about assessing the context. We need to go beyond that too. I am a qualitative researcher by training and I love qualitative methods, but I'm really seeing a need for studies that can quantify the degree to which outer and inner context factors influence policy. So that's kind of where my mind's sticking right now. Um, <clears throat> I think it's also important to optimize existing DNI frameworks. I don't think that we always need to reinvent the wheel with untested models. We have a lot of great ideas that already exist in the DNI field. It's just about how do we optimize them and apply them in ways that are relevant to the policy level. Um, I think I've shown in a couple of studies we used EPIS, and that one is it's a highly flexible framework that really does work at the policy level and was designed to work in that way. It just hasn't always been applied in that way. So be thinking about the motivation behind the development of these frameworks, be thinking about how you can pull policy out of the outer context so it's not just a nuisance variable. And if you do have an interest in that framework discussion and you're gonna be at the DNI conference next week, we have a panel where we're talking about that exclusively on the 16th. So I would encourage you to come to that or I'm happy to share materials from it. So with that, I'll close and open it up for questions and comments. And thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.
Thank you so much, Erica, for presenting uh, today. This was just really fascinating for me because I, I know your work, but um, you've been doing so much more than I even was aware of. And so and I loved the, the metaphor of taking a flight with you and that exhausting combination of efforts. <laughs> something that I absolutely chuckled at. So thank you. Um, so uh, a person put in the chat, um, I think when you finished talking about the West Virginia part, um, that it that you know your efforts have been really interesting, and lots of children are at risk for maltreatment or neglect, are actually being placed into foster care as a result of untreated opioid use disorder. And that comment just made me think, you know, how how do you take what you can learn from these, you know, contextual assessments of how policy is developed? and share that back with policymakers to help them see, you know, how decisions are being made and the impact of those decisions and maybe even improve that policymaking process in the future. Like, do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a great question. So one thing as a qualitative researcher, right, we sometimes we talk about member checking where you do interviews and you and you sort of have the preliminary themes in mind and you, you go back to some of the people, the key stakeholders that you interviewed and you say, hey, this is kind of what I'm seeing in the data. Do these themes resonate with you? Do these processes and phenomena, are they representative of what you think is really going on and what you tried to communicate with me? And sometimes sharing that back, it's a great tool for you as a researcher to double check yourself, um, especially when you're talking about something that's so complex and messy as policy. but it's a good it's a good opportunity for them to sort of hear as well what you're hearing and seeing as an outsider. Um, and related to that was interesting that in Oregon, so we're engaging with the state health department and an independent state commission that oversees substance use and treatment delivery for this whole statewide um, system and a couple others as well. And what we've heard in some managed care organizations, and we've asked all of these people to participate in individual interviews to really understand their context and their initiatives, their competing demands, et cetera. And every single one of those entities has said, we would love to do this, this sounds awesome. Can you maybe share some high level findings with us so that we can learn from you? And that's what I mean about being amenable to their asks. Of course, I said, yes, I will share, you know, aggregated, de-identified high-level findings with you. I'm not going to tell you who participated in my interviews, and you won't be able to see that in any way in the data. But yeah, let's feed this information back so that it's useful for you and me. Um, and I think when we feed it back, we need to think about ways to deliver it. So as a one or two pager, right, an informational brief, maybe even an infographic, something that's super digestible because nobody wants to read a really long report um, and, and see how I used a conceptual framework. Like that's just not their interest. And so as researchers, we, be, we need to be amenable to that as well and think about the ways they wanna digest information. It's funny in my, um, I didn't talk about it here today, but in my K application, I talk about really asking, so I'm doing a survey where I'm asking policymakers, how do you wanna receive information on certain topics? Like what's the best way to present it to you? And not only that, but like, who's the interme intermediary you want to see it coming from? Who do you trust? So I think we don't have a lot of great evidence on that quite yet, especially in the substance use field, which has just been so stigmatized and politicized. So there's more work to be done there. And hopefully I'll be doing that work <laughs> with others. I hope, so. I hope so too. I just submitted a grant proposal um, on evidence-based policymaking, which I will tell you about at another time. But what I love is that we were we have a knowledge translation core for exactly that reason about how to share information back to people. And I, I'm starting to realize the benefit of having research staff who are really good at graphic design for, yes. that, for that reason so that they can help develop those kinds of materials. So I'll move on. So I'm, I'll, I'll just, I have some questions to ask you while we're waiting for other people to put questions in the chats. But one thought I had also was, um, if you, what role you've seen of how uh, stakeholders that you've talked to view evidence. And I'm thinking of the work that like Greg Ahrens has done and Larry Palinkas about how people think about evidence, how they use evidence. 
Um, and did you see any challenges to how stakeholders actually view evidence as, as a starting place? Like, you know, and how evidence about um, like any evidence-based practices in substance use treatment are viewed and how that informs like a policy decision-making process. Yeah, I had that question in mind a lot with the second study that I did in California, Virginia, and West Virginia. I mean, it was like even a specific question in my interview guide. How do you, where do you get evidence? What is evidence? And how do you feel about it? I, I was genuinely curious to what extent like Medicaid agency staff who are tasked with creating a whole substance use care continuum, like, do you have training in substance use? Like, what's your knowledge um, level? And most of them will tell you they're generalist um, or they're like, yeah, behavioral health. And they kind of really mean mental health when they say that a little bit um, with an interest in promoting high quality substance use treatment, but maybe they don't, they don't have like the exact exposure to what that is. Um, they sort of said, no, I never look at, I don't look at the scientific literature. Like that's not digestible. It's not easy for me to access. Like there are paywalls. I wouldn't even know where to start in terms of like what journals to trust or how to search for it. Like PubMed is, is second nature to us, but PubMed kind of makes no sense to anyone else, right? Like Google <laughs> makes more sense. So that was kind of funny. Um, and what I was surprised is they sort of said, I don't know how to rate evidence or I, what we found in that study is they said things like, you know, I don't know what makes an evidence-based practice an evidence-based practice. Like what's the threshold for that? I have no idea, but I trust my friends. I trust my colleagues. And so they have this network where they really trust peer-to-peer -peer communication. What have other state Medicaid agencies done? What do their behavioral health department colleagues who they viewed as having more expertise and specific knowledge know? Um, what does the public health agency know? So what, what we saw is um, this idea, this thirst for knowledge that is accessible about evidence and research. It, they want it communicated from people they trust and that's helping to break down silos between state agencies that have traditionally been siloed in a lot of places. But there's certainly a lot of work to be done, especially as researchers and thinking about how we communicate research findings. I think we we get stuck in this idea of publish or perish, but we need to be thinking about publishing, meaning things like infographics, meaning things like going to conferences that policymakers go to, not just going to our academic conferences. And, and there's a comment in the chat that says, you know, there's also a mix of opinions and attitudes towards opioid use treatment, for example, medication assisted recovery, as well as the capacity to deliver care in the recovery community, which may be an interesting next step for your oh, study. Oh, I love that comment. And I really hope that you are a reviewer of my K <laughs> because it's all about <laughs> medications for opioid use disorder, the whole thing, because I agree. That's a, it's a very important next step. It's, it's a priority policy from the ONDCP, um, the White House office. Um, <laughs> I love the enthusiasm here. Please be a reviewer for my K. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of, I mean, we, and I just think nothing has been studied more in the substance use space other than medications for opioid use disorder. We have so much evidence about what works, um, but so much hesitation to implement it and so much stigma around what it means to use medications for opioid use disorder. So there's a lot of health policy DNI work to be done in that space. And then thinking about capacity of the recovery community to deliver services, right? There are policy levels that are barriers um, in terms of like who can prescribe in certain states because practice guidelines in certain states compete with the federal guidelines in the CARE Act. Um, and then there's a lot of stigma within the community of individuals uh, in recovery, right? About like, if you use medications, then you're not really sober or you're not in recovery. So there's a lot of stigma for us to work on in education and evidence dissemination to get out there. And I just wanted to say thank you for introducing the EPIS framework, the LOCI implementation strategy. We haven't had a lot of focus on either one of those in this seminar series. And LOCI is obviously not in the ERIC list of implementation strategies, but it's really a combination of many of those strategies put into one 
sort of complex strategies such as like facilitation. So I really encourage people to look more into loci. Um, unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour, so we can't go into that in more detail. But thank you so much, Dr. Crable, for uh, rounding out our fall seminar series. And um, people will be able to view this uh, recording online. The slides will not be available, but the recording will be. And uh, stay tuned for um, spring 2021 implementation science seminar series, which is actually going to be a theme of linking artificial intelligence with implementation science. So it was fun that you mentioned um, an AI platform of listen. I thought, oh, that's a nice segue into um, how we're going to be trying to explore artificial intelligence and implementation science uh, together. So thank you again. Thanks to everyone for being here and see you in the new year. Take care. Thank you.